Hey, good morning, brothers and sisters in Christ, visitors who are joining us. Welcome to Watermark Community Church. My name is John Elmore. I'm one of the teaching pastors here, and it's so good to be with you this Sunday. So, I went to this baby shower, first baby shower I'd ever been to. Didn't know what it was. I was working at an ad agency down in Austin, Texas. I'm like, what, you watch a kid bathe? Like, that's creepy. Uh, they're like, no, you bring gifts. So I go to Babies R Us or whatever it is. I look up the registry. I get the gift. I get something nice, single without kids. First one, got to go big. And I, and I pull up to the house where this baby shower is, and I'm watching people walk in. And they got like cellophane wrapped baskets with balloons, nice wrapping paper with like a stuffed animal tied to it. And I'm like, oh, no, I don't have anything to wrap my gift in. And so I was like, I got it. Zip, took up my jacket, put it around the gift, wrapped it up in my, in my coat. Y'all, if you've been around here any, you know that I used to be a drunk. I was an idiot. Man, that's like, well, that's how I rolled through life. Anyway, I walk in with my coat wrapped gift and I set it down there on the nice table with all the other gifts. I'm like, this is a disgrace. And then they get around, Kristen, my coworker, gets around to opening the gifts. And then uh, they're like looking at it. They're like, is this a, uh, and I'm like, yeah, that's, that's mine. You can unwrap it. She's like, okay, zip. <laughs> like, I don't know what I got her, bottles or something. She opens it up and I'm like, hey, can I have my jacket back? <laughs> that's it. You don't get that wrapping paper. She's like, yes. Laura and I have received a gift, a couple. We've received the gift of like closeness these last two years that we didn't have before. Been married almost 13 years. Wait, 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 12. Uh, <laughs> it's because I love her so much. I'm like, man, surely it's been longer. Uh, we, we got this gift of closeness, like, like intimacy, spiritually, emotionally, relationally, where we're just like, Man, we are, we are committed in a new way, in a depth of appreciation that's new. That's the gift that we received. But like my jacket baby shower gift, this gift of closeness for Laura and I in our marriage came really strangely wrapped. And the wrapping that was around that gift that we had to tear open to get to was breast cancer and a mental illness that my wife suffers from called OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder. She has unwanted cognitive, intrusive thought loops that she can't shake, sometimes for months at a time that bring anxiety. And I haven't shared about that a lot from the stage. Laura's like, hey, I, I think you should share it because I think there's others who are struggling with mental illness too. They're suffering in silence. And so, yeah, I'll go first so that it's safe for everybody else. And so we unwrapped that, the wrapping of OCD and cancer Inside was a gift of closeness. And for every single believer who can hear these words today, you are going to suffer. You're going to suffer in this life. I probably don't even have to tell you. You probably already have. And you may be now. You're certainly going to. You are going to suffer. And that's the strange wrapping around a gift that you'll receive through that suffering, which is intimacy with Christ a depth of appreciation and love and connection and devotion and dependency upon Christ. It will come strangely wrapped. I just looked over at Warren and Cindy, and I know that they've walked through some difficulty in the past, but what they got is dependency upon Christ, strangely wrapped. And so it's coming for all of us. Suffering could be Divorce could be mental illness, physical illness, loss of a loved one, prodigal child, loss of a job, financial trouble, the loneliness that can come at different stages in life. There is suffering coming from all of us, but God gives us a solution in the suffering that he allows, and it's his grace. It's he himself that he gives us in our suffering. Today we're continuing in our First Peter series. We're in chapter four. If you want to open your Bible, turn there or on your phone. Chapter four, verses 12 through 19. And what we're going to see is that suffering is coming, but how we will navigate that in Christ and how he will meet us in our suffering. There's many passages in the Bible that talk about God's will. 
Like, and this is God's will for you. It says in 1 Thess 4, it is God's will that you be sanctified, that you avoid sexual morality. There's all these verses that say this is God's will. We're going to get one today in this passage. It says, and, and like, hold on, because we're going to unpack it. It's God's will that you suffer. Suffering is God's will. Second, faithful is God's character. And third, good, doing good is God's fruit. So that's what we're going to do today. You're also, we're going we're gonna to talk through verses 12 through 18. It's not going to be an outline. It's going to be commentary on the verses that I'm going to give as we walk through it. And then we're going to camp out for the, the balance of the time on verse 19. Reason being, it is a summary statement. It's a distillation of verses 12 through 18 that you get in 19. Because of that, and because suffering is coming for every single one of us, on the screen behind me through the duration of the service is going to be verse 19. The reason for that is because I want every single person to walk out of here with that verse memorized. That as I'm talking, as we have time to pray, that you're going to be looking up at that verse and that you would commit it to memory because we need to memorize scripture so that we can live scripture. That's verse 19. I see some of you doing screen grabs right now and there's going to be another one later. So let's begin. Verse 12. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you. This fiery trial, he talks about it in 1 Peter chapter 1 when he talks about the fiery afflictions that have come upon you and gold that perishes through the fire, but this will result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. He's coming back to that. He's hearkening back to that, now saying this fiery trial, it's a test. It's not an accident. It's not a coincidence. It's not bad luck. It's a test. A test for us as believers, as though something strange were happening to you. Look, right here, it's like, God's like, hey, don't be surprised. I don't want you to be surprised. You're going to walk through this world. You're going to face hardship, really, at every corner and stage of life. Don't be surprised. Nothing strange happening to you. It's not you. It's not because you've, you, you just have some special curse upon you. That's not the case. You are in Christ, and we're going to see so you share his sufferings. In Haiti, I spent a summer there, my first year of seminary, and there's a phrase that they say. They say, de ye mon. It means there are mountains beyond mountains. I talked to a Haitian member here. He was born in Haiti, Pressois, and I said, hey, I want you to unpack for me the depth of meaning of that phrase, there's mountains beyond mountains. Like when a Haitian says that, what is it they have in mind? You see, the nation of Haiti used to be Hispaniola. They originally were not there but they were brought as slaves by Napoleon to work the sugar plantations. They are the first nation in the world to abolish slavery and push Napoleon, of all people, out. And then they remained a free people. But in that freedom, they had some work to do to, to rule and subdue over that entire Island, which is mountainous. I mean, we hiked to the top of a mountain to get to a freshwater spring, and you get up to the mountain, you're expecting to see the, the beautiful beach, and instead it's just like, poof, mountain. You climb that one, you crest the top, poof, mountain. It's just mountains beyond mountains. And the reason why they said that is they were free from their struggle from Napoleon, and then they faced hardship after hardship after hardship. It's a phrase in Haiti. We, we here, we've got our credit cards, we can throw up problems. In Haiti, they're like, no, there's problems beyond problems. But they say it because they have strength beyond strength. And so what it is, it's, hey, there's problems, but there is a gumption, there's a tenacity, there's a strength of Haitians. Like, we're not giving up. We remember what we came from, and so we will persevere. They aimant, gaimant. There's mountains beyond mountains, but we're going to go over them all. Don't think something strange is happening to you. But rejoice, verse 13, insofar as you share in Christ's sufferings. These fiery trials, you know how God views this? His economy, his view, as he looks down and sees us suffering, is like, you're sharing with Christ. You are sharing the sufferings of Christ. What an honor. 
And I don't know the suffering of everyone that's been in this room, but as the suffering comes, you are sharing with Christ. It's profound. To be in Christ is to suffer with Christ, and he will be with you in your suffering, always. And so it says rejoice in the sufferings. This is important. You don't rejoice for the sufferings. You rejoice in the sufferings. You don't thank God for the suffering. You give thanks in the suffering. You rejoice in it. Why can you rejoice in it? It says that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. Remember, it's a test and eternity is to come. So you can rejoice now knowing that if you're in Christ, you can rejoice later. That this life is a vapor, a mist, and a shadow according to the word of God. That it's going to be a blink. And that what is to come is glory forevermore as we are united with Christ forever in heaven and the new heaven and new earth with resurrected bodies where there's no pain, tear, no sorrow. We rejoice now because we will rejoice later when Christ is revealed. Verse 14. If you are insulted for the name of Christ. He's gonna give one example. There's many. This is a representative of one. As it says in Matthew 5, it gives various persecutions and suffering and afflictions because you're in Christ. If you're insulted for the name of Christ, you're blessed. Why? How, how, how can I reconcile that I'm insulted because of Jesus at my office, at my school, by my family who thinks I'm crazy? and says that I'm a bigot, or as they're universalist, and I said, no, Jesus is the only way, you're insulted by the name of, for the name of Christ, you're blessed. Well, how can I be blessed in that? Because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. That is the only time in all of scripture that phrase is used, the spirit of God and glory, the spirit of glory in God rests upon you. Spirit of glory in God rests upon you uniquely, uniquely as you suffer on behalf of the name of Christ. That when you suffer in Christ, there is an outpouring of God unique to your circumstance to sustain you and hold you and keep you that you would not break. You've had these moments before, I know you have. I, uh, it's like you see someone going through something and you're like, how, how are they going through that? With, with peace or joy or, or the good that they're doing no matter what they're going through. Like, how are they doing that? Scripture tells us right here how. Because the spirit of glory in God is being poured out of them in that moment, holding them, sustaining them, moving through them uniquely in that suffering. They couldn't go through it apart from that. And because you're not going through it, you're not receiving that, like, special gift of God. So you're like, how, how in the world? But when you get in that suffering, he's got you, just like he did them. I wanna show you a picture. It's gonna pop up on the screen. This is the Wolf family. They're here at Watermark. This is one of Laura's best friends from high school, Zach and Kelsey Wolf. And when you see this picture, you'll be like, oh, a put together family. Like, man, they, they look like they've got a good thing going. See? Just kidding. Thank you, Alex. I'm like, man, I guess I'll start ad-libbing. Here we go. Uh, <laughs> this is the Wolf family. Great looking family, right? They got it all together. That's what you think. You know, we see people walking around, you're like, they don't have the problems like I have. <laughs> Must be nice to be them. They've, I mean, I'm the only one walking through this. Let me tell you something. Everybody's got their battles. Everyone is walking through something Everyone, I don't care what Sunday best they're wearing, I don't care where they live or what they drive, I don't care single or married, everybody's got something. Remember that and treat them with grace. So I wanna show you something. These represent um, suffering, these um, skewers, sharpened sticks. The Wolf family, for two years they suffered with infertility. That was, that was a thorn in the side, two years. And then they got pregnant and had their first child, Ellie, that big sister you see on the screen. But when they brought her home from the hospital, Kelsey started having dizzy spells, and then she started having seizures. Seizures. So the doctor's like, hey, you should probably go get an MRI. The MRI revealed that she had a brain tumor. They tested the brain tumor. It was brain cancer. So they went through cancer treatment. That was a hard one. 
But then they couldn't have another child biologically because of the cancer treatment. If they were to give up that, they could lose the child and vice versa. And so they wanted to adopt. Kelsey did. Zach was like, I don't want to adopt. It doesn't feel right to me. Like, I don't know if I'll love the child the way I love Ellie. I don't know about that. In the community group that they are in, one of the members, they adopted. Zach saw the unconditional love of that community group member as they adopted. and was like, okay, I'm in. Let's adopt. It's according to God's will, right? Care for Orphans and widows, let's adopt. For two years they tried to adopt, closed door, closed door, closed door. That was an affliction and they gave up adoption but they got a call two weeks later. After they stopped trying, you persevere in Christ and just wait on God and said, hey, we've got a baby. If you want the child. It was during COVID, they drove through, didn't even go to the hospital, sight unseen, didn't know what the kid would even look like, be like, whatever condition. They receive Oliver. The little boy. After Oliver was there, Zach's little brother tragically died. But they would tell you that Oliver looks strikingly just like Zach's little brother. And so the reason why I'm holding up these sticks is because I want to show you something. This is a balloon, normal balloon. This represents the Wolf family, Zach and Kelsey, Ellie and Oliver. Just a normal balloon. This represents them, and what I'm gonna show you is that when these afflictions come, if you are in Christ, the special grace that God pours out on you, the spirit of glory and God that rests upon you when you suffer on behalf of Christ will not break you. So here's infertility. That's crazy, huh? How could you go through infertility and that not break you? You wanted to have a child and your God won't let you have a child? You try to adopt and he won't let you adopt? What about the brain cancer? You trust in God, you say he's gonna care for you? You've got brain cancer and now you can't even have another kid. And the adoption, it didn't even work out. You couldn't get an adoption. And then you adopt and your little brother dies. And that's hard, and this balloon should pop right now. I got some people looking at me like, what in the world? <laughs> that's what people think when they look at you as you suffer with Christ, for Christ, on behalf of Christ, that you share in his sufferings. They're gonna be looking at you like, what in the world? How come you're not breaking right now? <laughs> because the spirit of glory in God rests upon you in your suffering. If you're in suffering, he will be with you in your suffering. And one day, all that suffering is going to be gone. And it will be glory forevermore as we abide with Christ. But the holes remain. Christ was raised from the dead and showed his holes in his hands and his side. But then the suffering was for God's glory. So there will still be scars in heaven just like Jesus. But they will portray the glory of God that rested upon you in this life. That will give him glory forever in the next. Verse 15. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or as an evildoer, as a meddler. Let me tell you something. Suffering for sin is not suffering. If you're like, yeah, man, I got a DUI, I got it so bad, why is God letting me go through this? Man, I've got this like addiction to pills or weed or porn, and God's just like, you know, this is his fault. No. My wife's upset with me because of this. That's not suffering. That's discipline. That's the discipline of the Lord. That's Hebrews 12. That's a different chapter. When you suffer because of sin, it's not suffering, it's consequences that we would repent from sin. So he's saying like, hey, if you're suffering as a murderer or a thief, you're not suffering. Suffer for Christ. Yet, he says, if anyone suffers as a Christian follower of Christ, let him or her not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. This was written in an honor-shame culture there in the ancient Near East. And so they were already shamed for following Christ. This is written just 
decades after Jesus walked the earth, they're like, you guys are freaks. You're following a man who was crucified and raised again. They were already rejected, and now they're suffering. Loss of job, loss of status, loss of friends, loss of family. But he's saying, you're blessed. You are blessed. And don't be ashamed, it says. Jesus says in Luke 9, if you were ashamed of me and my words, then when the Son of Man comes, he will be ashamed of you. Now let me tell you something. This, this does not align with our culture. And as you live it and proclaim it and counsel others with it, as you don't go with the flow, but you say, hey, I, I can't do there, I can't go that, I'm not about that, I'm not sleeping with you, boyfriend, I'm not cheating on my taxes, I'm not gonna write some false expense on my business account, no, I'm not doing that, why? Why, man? Come on, just put it down. Just do this. No, I, I, I don't because the word of God, because I'm a follower of Jesus. He says, you're going to suffer and that there's a blessing in that. <clears throat> Let him not be ashamed. Don't you be ashamed. As they say, like, give me a break. Why do you follow this? Why do you follow Jesus? Don't you know there's many paths up the mountain? Do not be ashamed. Or it says, of he and his words, or when he comes, he'll be ashamed of you. You stand firm. Stand firm in Christ. So, I talked about Oren and Cindy earlier. One of Oren's friends, he's our senior director of equipping, he invited Dr. Stephen Presley to come to a training day this coming weekend. There's gonna be a slide on the screen. Stephen Presley has given much of his life to studying the early church the first 400 years because they lived in a hostile culture. Christians lived in like rampant hostility towards Christ. They lived and proclaimed Christ in hostility. Sound familiar? So you can go to that training day and be like, dude, that's what, I, that's what I'm living. Like, my work, my family, my neighborhood, you can go and learn how to live and proclaim Christ in a hostile culture. Verse 17, for it's time for judgment to begin with the household of God. Or you hear that and you're like, wait, judgment? I've trusted in Jesus. How, judgment for the household of God? It's not judgment condemnation. This judgment is a testing. It's a testing as we go through this suffering that God's watching how we respond. Are we gonna respond in following him and glorifying him and trusting him? Or are we gonna be ashamed of him? Are we gonna renounce him? Throughout church history in the early years, there were two great times of peace followed by great times of persecution. And there was more apostasy in that time, as God was testing, judgment was coming on the household of God and people were leaving the church. Why? Because they came during a time of peace and when suffering came, they're like, no, I'm out, I'm out on this. Like I didn't sign up for that and left. And so what testing can do is both purify and purge. Unbelievers who were just here for like religious attendance were like, I'm out, <laughs> I don't want this. And Christians are like, no, where else would I go? You have the words of eternal life. Like I'm, I'm, all, I'm all in, I'm in Christ, you hold me. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome of those who do not obey the gospel of God? The gospel of God. The gospel of God is that he created you there's unbelievers in the room. There's, there's some here, people, who are like, I do not believe in Jesus. I'm here as a guest. I don't know what you're talking about. Now I'm talking to you. I used to be an alcoholic. Listen to these words. Changed my life. God made you. He created you. He loves you. But because of your sin, you've been separated from him. He's holy and you have sin, so you can't be in his fellowship. So he sent Jesus to die in your place. Perfect Son of God, fully man, fully God, died the death on the cross that you deserved. Wrath of God poured out on him, dead, buried, raised again, showing that he was God in flesh for the forgiveness of sins. You can place your faith in him today. If you want to be forgiven today, you can be saved. You can repent from your sins. Spirit of God, come into you as you confess your sins and receive Jesus, the forgiveness of God in Christ. That's the gospel of God. Because listen, it says, and if the righteous are scarcely saved, Jesus said it's the narrow, hard path and few enter it, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? He's like, you think this suffering's bad in this life? What will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Knowing that eternal torment 
in hell awaits anyone. You reject God in this life, you will be apart from him forever in the next. Trust in Jesus today. And then as Wayne Grudem says, this next verse, verse 19, summarizes the entire passage. And more than that, this verse summarizes the entire letter of First Peter. Listen to the words. Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. So here we go. Suffering is God's will. Faithful is God's character. Doing good is God's fruit. And remember, remember that verse behind me to memorize it. Suffering is God's will. It says, therefore, the therefore is just saying, hey, that whole passage, it's been condensed and distilled by the Spirit through Peter. And here you go, verse 19. This is it. Listen. Let those who suffer, it's not if, but when. Jesus has been said, he was and is and is to come. We also have suffering that was and is and is to come. So any suffering that comes, Jesus is right there with you, in you, covering you. Let those who suffer according to God's will. This is a hard and comforting theology. It's incredibly hard because it's, it's difficult to reconcile, like, wait, if God is all-powerful, all-knowing, ever-present, and you, you, you allowed this? Suffering is according to your will? So that's what's hard. Here's what's comforting. That anything in your life, if it came to pass, if the suffering came to pass, it first passed through the hand of God. He sovereignly allowed it for you to share in the sufferings of Christ. It's a strangely wrapped gift, but what you're going to get is God as it's wrapped in suffering. If it came to pass, it first passed through the hand of God according to God's will, which is really helpful. It's really helpful to know that he's not asleep or aloof, but that he knows, he sees, he either allowed or ordained the suffering. Behind me, there's going to be an anvil graphic. There's an anvil that Trisha Griffin, a graphic designer here on our staff, created. It's an anvil because this is the passage. It says that we have a creator. A blacksmith is making something as he pounds and strikes and places back in the fire and shapes and shifts. That metal is feeling those strikes and pounds, yet the creator, the blacksmith, he's making something. He's doing something. It's not in vain. Your suffering is never in vain. God will redeem your pain. And so there is an anvil because the crushing hurts but God's in it. He's doing something. You gotta trust him, which is what the verse is gonna say. And so this anvil is gonna be available on social media. Some of you are doing screen grabs. You can go to Watermark Community Church on Instagram. You can pick it up there. Courtney's already placed it. And if you don't know what I'm even talking about, you can tap somebody who's got their phone out and be like, bro, can you text that to me? And so here's why. The first letter of every word is there so they can aid in scripture memory. Dwell differently is an account on Instagram that I commend to you. It helps you to memorize the scripture. It gives you the key. Scripture typer is another way. But as you look at those letters, T, therefore, L, let, T, those who suffer according to God's will. It just goes on and it helps you. So save it as your home screen. Check this out. Clear that. That's Laura. She's like, what do you want for lunch? Uh, <laughs> Put this on your home screen. Remember, this is not just a message for today. This is a message for your life. You need this in your heart because the day of trouble is coming and, and you need to be like, okay, okay. Let those who suffer according to the will of God entrust their souls to a faithful creator while continuing to do good. You need that. Everyone, everyone, memorize it. Listen to these lyrics. This is The Pain You Let Me Feel by Benjamin William Hastings. If you have all authority, then if I'm feeling pain, it's because you're letting me. But I've lived long enough to know you want the best for me always. Well, life isn't always what I thought it ought to be. Listen to these words. My circumstance will not define your sovereignty. My circumstance will not define your sovereignty. 
because I've lived long enough to know you want the best for me. Always listen again. Maybe you'll calm the storm. It's always our prayer, isn't it? Maybe you'll calm the storm, but maybe you sent it. That is a right theology according to the scripture. Let those who suffer according to God's will, he either allowed it or ordained it. Maybe you'll calm the storm, but maybe you sent it. Still, whatever you ask of me, it could be said, whatever fiery trial you allow me to pass through, I know you're going to be walking in the fire with me. Lord, not your will, my will, be not your will. Not my will, your will be done. Of all the times to mess up. (laughs) Jesus in the garden. Father, if possible, let this cup pass. Yet not my will, your will be done. Whatever suffering you find yourself in. Suffering is God's will. Faithful is God's character. It says entrust their souls. According, if, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls. It doesn't say entrust your money, entrust your marriage, entrust your relationships, entrust your work, entrust your house, entrust your kids. He's like entrust your soul. The rest, the moth and rust are going to destroy. Every person's going to die. You're going to face sickness. All the money's going back to someone or something. Entrust your soul. He's got your soul. Andy Minio, Christian rapper, says, I fear God alone, and he's on my side. I fear God alone, and he's on my side, come what may, and trust their souls to a faithful, an attribute of God, to a faithful creator. Let's talk about faithful for a second. It says you can trust him. He's faithful. No matter what you're seeing, like, God, you see this? Yes, he sees this. He neither sleeps nor slumbers. He sees it. He's watching. He's carrying you. He's with you. His grace upon you. He's faithful. It's not a single time. You're like, where were you in that moment? He's like, I was with you. I was grieving with you. I'm carrying you. I've got you. He's faithful. Every time will not fail you. Faithful creator. Now, if I'm suffering, I'm not thinking creator. I'm not thinking like, okay, so you made the mountains and the animals? Like, great. I'm like, I want a rescuer. I want a redeemer. I want the advocate. Why? Faithful creator. Here's why I think it says faithful creator. I stared at that word. It's used six times in the whole Bible as the title of God. Three in the Old Testament, three in the New. Peter says, again, by the Spirit. The Spirit's like, Peter, write down creator. Faithful creator. Why? Here's why. Because he made something from nothing. He brought light to darkness. He brought life from non-life. He led the Israelites by a pillar of smoke by day and pillar of fire by night. When they hit the dead end of the Red Sea, the creator splits it. Then they're like, we don't have food. Rains down manna. We don't have water. Water from the rock. We want meat. He rains down quail. He feeds Elijah from ravens. Elijah doesn't have food. He sends ravens day and night to bring him his meals. Fire fell on Sodom. The walls fell on Jericho. Satan fell from heaven. That's what he does. And he walked in the fire. He walked on water. And he will walk on the serpent. That's the creator. That's the creator with you in your suffering. So he's going to provide for you. There is one singular time that someone was fed from ravens in this entire book. One time. So so you don't know how God's going to provide for you in your suffering. You just know he will. He will. And he's going to do something creative that's going to blow your mind. And then it's going to be like, only God. only, Only a creator could do that. He's got you. And he will. Suffering is God's will, faithful is God's character, doing good is God's fruit. Orrin, who I've mentioned before, I send him my sermon notes a lot of times. It was suffering is God's will, and then I had doing good is God's will, because that's what it says, while doing good. I'm like, well, that's, that's God's will. It's what he wants us to do. And Orrin's like, hey, I, it's true. I think people might misunderstand, though. I think there's a possibility. They might think when they're suffering, like, all right, bootstraps, got to do good. God says so. 
I can't believe this. I'm suffering, God. You serious? Okay, great. Well, I'm going to go serve at the shelter. I'm going to bring food to my neighbor. Or go share the gospel while I'm suffering. Are you serious? You're asking me to do this? He's like, no. So I sent it back to Orrin. I'm like, hey, how about this? Doing good is God's fruit. He's like, that's it. He's going to move through you. You abide in him, he's going to bear that fruit through you. He's not asking you to do anything except abide in him and he bears the fruit. It's his fruit. If you do it apart from him, it's just like in flesh, in vain, you're going to get frustrated and bitter. That's what the Pharisees did. And Jesus is like, you're graves, whitewashed tombs, dead inside. We abide in him, he's going to bear that fruit. Doing good is God's fruit. God's got something to do. It's not grin and bear it in your suffering. It's abide and he'll bear it. While doing good. Without God, suffering turns us inward, right? Like it's just like introspection. Why me? Why me? Victim mentality in your suffering. God's like, no, hey, get out of yourself. It's love God, love others. (laughs) Don't be surprised. You're suffering. I'm with you. I got you. While doing good. We tell people a lot in recovery when they're struggling. Like, hey, go help somebody. You seem kind of stuck in your head. Go help somebody. There is a, it's a pine cone. There's a thing called a lodgepole pine. A lodgepole pine. They have, a, it's a coniferous tree, and they have these uh, serotonous pine cones. This is not one. It's just the only one I could find in Texas. But <laughs> a serotonous pine cone is, like, tight. It doesn't have these, like, f- fanned open things. It's tight because it's covered in resin which is like sticky, except when melted, but it's hard, it's hardened. Like these things can withstand a lot, a serotonous pine cone. And they'll stay on the tree for 30 to 50 years. And it's like, what's the point? Like drop, come on, make a tree. What are you doing there? 30 to 50 years, you know when they drop? When a forest fire comes. Forest fire burns up the tree, falls to the ground, and the serotonous pine cone there in the coals and embers melts. It melts the resin and it fans open And then comes the wind and blows all of those seeds. After a forest fire, two million seeds per acre from one of those pine cones that fell into the fire. Two million from one fire and pine cone. And that is what God does through the suffering. While he says, while continuing to do good, he's like, hey, you're you're about to be dropped into the fire. But I'm going to melt off all those fleshly desires. I'm going to melt off the sin that so easily entangles and the weights that hinder you. Those are going to melt off. You're going to open up. I'm going to bring the wind of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to blow the gospel through you as you do good. You're not going to perish. You're going to multiply. Unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground, it remains one. But if it does, there is a multitude. It's what God's going to do through your suffering as you abide in him and do good. And you might be like, man, great. Great. What about you, God, sitting up there in heaven? Must be nice. I'm down here suffering. When Jesus came to the earth in his moment of greatest suffering, Jesus was upon the cross. Listen to the good that he does. He saves someone. There's a thief hurling insults at him. We're told in Matthew, both thieves hurled insults at him. But at one point, Spirit of God starts tapping on that brother. And Jesus saves him. Talk about a good work. Jesus saves him, then gives him assurance of salvation. Quotes Psalm 22, the beginning. He's quoting scripture while he's up there. The very ones who are persecuting him and crucifying him, he prays to the Father on their behalf, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Then he looks down at his mom and John, and he says, woman, behold thy son. Son, behold thy mother. He's caring for his widowed mother in his suffering. Quoting scripture, praying, taking care of his mom. In his moment of greatest suffering, he's there doing good, giving us an example. I know that there's people here that you're probably like, you're, you're, you're reading my mail, like I'm suffering. I'm right now, I am in the fire right now. And we did this a couple of months ago where we invited you, if you're in a season of suffering, to stand, to briefly share with those around you, hey, it's financial trouble, it's loss of a loved one, 
it's uh, some trouble at work, just in a phrase to share it with them and for the body of Christ to come around you and pray for you. And look, I know that, 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 that that's a big ask. But we serve a big God who gives big grace. It says he opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. He will give grace to you as you stand and let people know you can be known here and loved here and prayed for. So if you're in a season of suffering in just a moment, I'm gonna invite you to stand in the body of Christ. If anybody's around you, I want you to move towards them. I want you to listen to them. I want you to lay hands on them and pray for them. Pray, pray to our faithful creator that he would sustain them, carry in them and meet them. Yeah, I see people standing already. Thank you for leading. Thank you for trusting us with your pain. If you're in a season of suffering, go ahead and stand. See in the back. Make sure that everyone who stands in the balcony, that you move towards them. All right, body of Christ, move towards the people who have stood. It's not too late to stand up. You move towards them and pray. If nobody's prayed for you, you let them know. Stand, pray for those who are standing. Y'all can keep praying over these people. Don't stop. Keep praying as the Lord leads you. It says in the scriptures that he carries our tears in a bottle. I believe that to be true because his word says it. I think when we get to him in heaven, you're going to see a bottle with every tear that brought him glory. It says he's near to the brokenhearted. It says he's the God of all comfort who comforts us in all of our afflictions. He will. He promises. His word is true. And as you continue to pray or memorize, I want to read this to you. This was written by Johnny Erickson Tata, who's a quadriplegic. And she wrote this. I, I, Laura gave me the quote, and I was like, man, that's a great quote for suffering. That makes sense that Johnny would write that. What's it from? And she said she wrote that to her friend who's a quadriplegic. Listen to these words. The night of this little dark world is already quickly passing away. The dawn of eternity will soon appear. And then the king's own voice will speak and every prisoner of hope, the afflicted, the struggling ones, will stand forth emancipated and unhurt the brighter, the gladder, and the more beloved for all the sufferings through which they passed. And there, they will magnify God's holy name for the salvation he wrought. And as each faithful spirit goes up to its eternal rest and his foes are at his feet forever, this will all be history. And all his boast will be, he believed in his God. <laughs> this will be all your history, Rika, she writes. And all your boast, she believed in her God. So brothers and sisters in Christ, we now get to stand and sing to the one who gives us a firm foundation, who walks with us through the fire, who is near to the brokenhearted. Sing and rejoice as you share in the sufferings of Christ. Amen.